You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 108, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Savers Gardening Products. Well, folks, today uh, we're going to talk about straw bale gardening, straw bale gardens. And today, as my guest, I've got an author, teacher, YouTuber, master gardener, man of science, speaker of truth, Robert Pavlis. He's written the books uh, Gardening Myths 1 and 2, uh, Building Natural Ponds, and uh, Soil Science for Gardener, his most recent book, which I just got in the mail uh, today, the day I'm going to interview him. So, uh, Robert Pavlis, say hello and tell us how you're doing and how's everything going in Ontario? Hey, it's great to be here. Uh, actually, we're having a terrible winter storm, so I'm glad I'm inside. <laughs> Uh, it was getting a little warmer here, but uh, boy, it's gotten cold again. It's it's not spring yet. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> we had the worst thing happen here. We had a, a whole bunch of snow, which is great. But then today it rained all day yeah. and all the snow is gone. And now it's going to be below zero the rest of the week and almost double digits overnight every night. Yeah. So that's that's for me the worst thing that can happen in March because the ground just turns to ice. Uh, I would just love it if we could get a snowy winter and it just stays snowy until like the last week of March. Um, but it always seems to be the case that it, the ground freezes in March. And the, the worst thing is that you can have a week like this where there's no snow on the ground and a couple of days of rain and everything freezes solid. Then we get snow on top of it and it just takes forever for the soil to thaw out. Mm -hmm. So who knows what's going to happen. Um, why don't we talk, uh, just before we get going and talk about, so Robert Pavlis wrote a couple articles on straw, straw bale gardening. I want to talk about that. That's what the bulk of this episode is about. But uh, we're going to talk just a briefly, we're going to have him back on to talk about this, but you got a new, new book, Soil Science for Gardeners. Tell us uh, maybe why, why you wrote this book and uh, why, uh, why our viewers might want to buy it. Well, I, I wrote the book because I looked around at other soil books for gardening and I found most of them had a lot of misinformation in them. As you know, I like to bunk myths <laughs> and uh, I just couldn't stand the books that were out there and all the nonsense that were in them. So I thought, well, someone's got to write a better book that's very factual. So I wrote this book and it's sort of divided into three sections. Part one uh, gives you all the background information about soils. You know, what is it, nutrients, what plants need and so on. Part two, helps you analyze the problems you have in your garden. And then part three helps you create a personalized remediation plan. How are you going to improve that soil and what are you going to do every year? And uh, the book actually has been doing really well. I'm, I'm actually shocked. <laughs> um, the first printing of it is sold out. Ah. It's only been on the market since for about 10 months now, 11 months, 10, 11 months. The second printing, uh, they're waiting for shipments now. And the other good news about the book is that they're going to make a CD on it. So it's going to be an audible book. With you reading it? Well, I'm not reading it. They're going to hire a professional for that. Some guy with a sexy voice. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> It makes soil sound so much better if they do. Um, <laughs> Narrated by Liam Neeson. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I, if anyone's interested in the book, the publisher is um, uh, New Society Publishers. And if you go to their website and order it, you can get a 25% discount if you use a coupon code of Pavlis 25. So the Pavlis is with a large P, A, V, L, I, S, 25. And they'll give you 25% off whatever the price is. And right now the eBooks are discounted anyway. So you get 25% on top of that discount. So it's a pretty good deal. You give me uh, the details to that. I'll put it in the description box of the YouTube video and I'll put it in the show notes. on If, if you're downloading this from my website, maritimegardening.com, it'll be the details that he just mentioned will be in those show notes. Otherwise, if you're watching this on YouTube, it'll be in the description box there. Yeah. Now you do have to get it from the publisher. If you go to Amazon to get the book, you won't get the discount. So, right. And so, okay. So we'll put a link to that. We'll put a link to the place you buy it and the coupon code 
and the details. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, you know, I can't remember when you wrote these things. I remember reading them, but, uh, you know, when, about a year ago or so, you were, how long ago did you write these articles? The first article was written, I think, two years ago. Two years ago. And I've heard about straw bale gardening forever. I'd never tried it. So my article is based on the research I found, different right. people's opinion. I think I have some references there to some scientific studies on it. There isn't, there isn't much in the way of scientific studies because it isn't considered to be a, a real traditional way of gardening. So scientists no. aren't interested. Oh, and it's not scalable on any sort of agricultural. Yeah. Really. Yeah. It, it was actually, it's interesting. It was originally started uh, to be used in greenhouses. So right. they thought rather than use soil in greenhouses, which has all kinds of problems, including a lot of pests and, and diseases, they actually thought straw bales might work better. And I think it is used in some greenhouses as a growing medium. Medium. And that's how it got started. And there is some research for that purpose. Right. And I think then the idea was taken and brought into the home garden and said, well, here, here's a new technique for gardening. It has some benefits and, and away they went. And so I analyzed it and looked at the pros and cons and tried to understand, you know, why would you use this? When would you use it? Um, I, I concluded that a lot of the so-called benefits are really not benefits of the technique. Uh, I wasn't totally sold on the idea uh, at the time. Right, and that, but, that the name of that article was called the uh, pro. What was it pros and cons? The pros, yeah, uh, straw bale gardening pros and cons. Okay, that was the first article. Yeah. Right. And then uh, last year, last spring, I had extra bales, and I thought, well, I guess I should really give it a try. This so, is what I like about your. This is something I don't do on my YouTube channel, but you do. You do these experiments. Um, I never, I'm, I'm too selfish with my, my garden space, <laughs> my time, whatever it is, you know? Uh, so, I mean, I, if I do an experiment, it's, it's by accident. Like I'll have two things that just happen to be similar, but slightly different. Um, but you actually, and I, and I never set it up in any sort of, any sort of methodology. And we're going to talk about how we went about to this was one thing I like about your, your writing, also your YouTube channel, you do these sort of experiments. Um, so yeah, so I, I thought, well, you know, people said, people kept telling me online, oh, this is a great technique, you'll love it, just give it a try, right? So I thought, okay, you got to give it a try, right? That's the only way to know for sure. And it actually is a good idea that I did because I learned things about it that I never got from reading material online, All right? So right. I actually learned unique things about the process. Okay. So, yeah, so I think... And I had a similar, when I first read about this method, I had a similar knee jerk reaction to you. I thought it looks like the pitches look great, um, but that's not soil. How do they get the stuff to grow? It can't just be, I mean, I could see peas and some things like that that can get their own nitrogen perhaps, but other things, you know, it's, so I had a lot of more questions than, uh, and it just seemed to sound a little bit too good to be true. Um, but I didn't even bother trying it like you did. I didn't, didn't, <laughs> I didn't give it, a, I didn't even give it a chance sort of thing. Uh, so I thought maybe uh, today in this uh, podcast, we'll talk about, we'll start with the, the second article. We'll start with the experiment you did. Um, so people can sort of hear how, how you set this thing up and then what you, what you observed. Um, so you can get a say, because it's a very, very popular. I mean, just, just type straw bale gardening and Google it, and it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, according to most of the stuff you read. Um, right. So why don't you, yeah, relate your experience to us? Yeah, so I just, what I want to, the, the problem with straw bale gardening and all the information online is they'll show you the technique and they'll tell you how great it was. And what I could never find was someone who actually compared it to growing in the ground. And that was one of the reasons I did this experiment. I wanted to do a side-by-side -side study and determine, you know, will my tomatoes grow better in the soil or, or in straw bales? And someone, I, I put that online and someone made the comment, well, 
that's not a good comparison because you can't grow the same way in straw bales as you do in soil. You have to garden differently. And that made some sense. So I actually set up three different experiments. One is my soil. So I grew plants exactly the way I always do. I didn't do anything extra to the soil, just my standard soil, my standard water and fertilizer and so on. Then I took one bale and I mimicked what I did in the garden. So the plants and seeds went into the straw bale, but once they were planted, I treated it just like soil. Same input, same if, care. If I, same if I watered my soil, I watered it. If I fertilized something, which I rarely do in my vegetable garden, I fertilized it, but I didn't do anything special to that straw bale. The third one, I used the method that everybody recommends. Okay. For the straw bale. For the straw bale. Now, what's interesting is that when I actually went to research the right method to do straw bale gardening, I came up with dozens of different right methods, right. which oh, kind of surprised yeah. me because a lot of the discussion online is, well, you have to do it correctly. And if someone tries the technique and it fails, the comment always is, well, you, you didn't do it right. You didn't use the right fertilizer. You didn't condition it right. You didn't water it enough and so on. And yet when you go and look for the right method, there isn't one. Everyone's got their own right method. So did you, maybe you could tell the, the viewers, I, my guess is that you came up with the average right method uh, <laughs> perusing the different uh, information. So what, what, what Methodologically, in terms of the experiment you were setting up, what what were you calling the right method? Yeah, so the median the, right method. <laughs> one of the uh, real strong proponents of this is a gentleman named uh, Joel Karsten, and he's even written a book on straw bale gardening. And it's interesting. I looked at all his material because, like, he's the guru, and he wrote the book. He must know how to do this. I couldn't find any information about which fertilizer to use. <laughs> just says use fertilizer. Uh, so that was no help. So yeah, I went through uh, some of the more popular publishers of the, uh, the, the method and I averaged it all out and came up with something that was as close as I could to an average of what people do. And the key to this whole process is you have to condition the straw bales before you ever start gardening. And what does condition mean? So it goes like this. On day one, you water the bale and you let it soak in. On day two, you add some nitrogen fertilizer like urea or, or you can use blood meal and you put about a cup of that on there and you water it. The next day you water it and you repeat this, urea, water, urea, water. You do this for up to day 10. On day 10, you put in a regular fertilizer, like a 10, 10, 10, and you water it again. And at the end of that process, so now we're at day 11, that straw should have started to decompose. And in fact, it should be quite warm because the, the, it's like a compost heap. It's degrading, right? The microbes are acting on the straw and turning it into nutrients. And once it's warm like that, it's ready to be planted. Okay, so that conditioning you have to do. Did you use a thermometer to determine that? Well, or you just feel it. You you can just feel it. Uh, it should it will never get hot enough to burn you, but it should be quite warm to the touch, like a body, like a body. Yeah. <laughs> so in my experiment, I'm doing it in zone five, and I started at two weeks before my normal planting time which is somewhere around the middle of April. And I went through this process and absolutely nothing happened. <laughs> there was no warming, there was no decomposition. Uh, the whole process didn't make a lot of sense to me because you put all this fertilizer on top and then you water it in. And they tell you, you have to water heavily until it runs out the bottom. Well, why would you put fertilizer on and then wash it all out the bottom? Like that makes no sense to me. But one thing I learned in this process is that in our climate, if you want to get an early garden, it doesn't work because it's too cold in zone five. Right. right? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so anyways, I went through the process and at the end of the conditioning process, I then started doing some planting and uh, my first crop is usually peas. So I would put peas in my soil and in both of these straw bales. And to be honest with you, I can kind of simplify this. The two straw bales pretty much both had the same kind of problems. What I did notice is on the one where I didn't fertilize it because I was treating it like my garden, the plants didn't grow well because they didn't get any fertilizer. So we can kind of take that one out of the equation. Did those two straw bales have any soil on top of them like you well it depends on what you plant in them so if you're putting plants in like a tomato seedling you just dig a hole in the straw and put the plant in and there is some soil that's around the roots of the plant right, right? Just a little, so, but there's like a coffee cup almost, sort of thing yeah almost no soil right and if you're doing seeding so like uh you're putting some radish seeds on or some carrot seeds in the spring you do put about an inch of soil on just and then you plant the seeds in the soil. Okay. Right. Um, the problem with that is that again, you water this thing every day, right? Well, the soil gets washed away pretty quickly. Just goes down. So it just well, it goes down and through the straw, right? It it's porous. It doesn't yeah. hold the soil. So I tried radishes, carrots, and beets because those are some of my early crops. And those are done with seeds. Not one of them germinated. I think one day I did see a radish seed germinate, but there was no soil or anything around it. So it just died. So none of those crops worked at all. Right. Um, the peas, the, the early crops didn't work either. Um, I did have some peas around for that I used for another experiment for one of my YouTube videos. And so they were growing in pots. So I thought, well, I'll give them a try. And so I put them in now. So they had some soil and they were already a couple inches tall when I put them in. And they actually did grow, but they were always much shorter than the ones in the ground. So the ones in the straw bale were something like two feet tall when it, they started flowering. The ones in the ground were more like six feet tall. <laughs> They also flowered more than a week after the ones in the soil. Right. Right. So, um, and, and you know, you know, in, in our climate, we have a very short summer and we do everything we can to get things in early and get that crop. Right. So what this was doing was delaying my spring by a week or two. Right. And I found that with all the vegetables I tried in it. Right. Now, once we got to a warmer weather, then I put things like uh, tomato plants in it. Um, what else? Um, oh, beans. I put some beans in as well. And once things warmed up, then there was some decomposition taking place in the straw. And those did actually fairly well. But again, uh, with the tomatoes, for instance, the plants were much shorter. I never get blossom end rot in my soil. I mean, in 20 years, I've never seen blossom end rot. The ones in the bales got blossom end rot. Um, the beans were 10 days behind the beans in the ground. So they did grow and they did produce fruit. Same with the tomatoes. They both produce fruit, but they were behind. The plants were smaller. Um, so not one of the crops I tried did better in either of the stra straw bales. Right. And the one that I was doing properly, I was fertilizing the heck out of it. So every three or four days, I'd throw some more fertilizer on there and water it in. All for, season? All season. All well, that's season. You, that's, you have to keep fertilizing this. Because you have to remember that there's no nutrients in a bale of straw, Right. I mean, it is slowly decomposing and the people online say, well, that that decomposition is releasing nutrients. But I don't believe that because what's happening is that, that you get some decomposition, but any nitrogen that's released is going to be gobbled up by bacteria trying to decompose the rest of the straw. 
That's a really good. Also, you're watering it every damn day. And you're watering uh, every day. So you're, you keep washing the, the nutrients out of that thing, right? Yeah, that's a really good the, the double whammy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, in a warmer climate, if, if you condition these things properly, and if by midsummer these things are, you know, are half decomposed, the story might be different. You might then get nutrients. But almost everybody online says you got to fertilize these things constantly. You, you can't stop fertilizing. Oh Whereas in my soil, I might fertilize twice a season. I right? never for, I never fertilize my garden. I haven't fertilized it. I've never fertilized my garden. I, I don't usually either, but I, I thought, well, this year I would throw some nitrogen in and see if it makes a difference. But yeah, in the last 10 years, most years I don't put anything on my garden. Yeah, so that's a pretty big difference to like one or two fertilizations or none at all, as opposed to what'd you say, every three days? No, oh, every three days, like you throw some on. Yeah, you wow. got to keep because uh, someone made the comment that growing in straw bales is kind of like growing hydroponically, right? The straw is only a thing to hold the plant up, a place for the roots to grow. Yeah, uh, you have to supply the nutrients for that because you're not going to get much from the straw. And that's the case in hydroponics, right? We're supplying all the nutrients that that plant will get. And then there's some sort of material in there that's holding the plant up. Yeah. So straw bale gardening, I think, is mostly a hydroponic process. What if you had like, let's say you've got, think of a, you know, a straw bale is like a, What's that called? It's not a cube. There's a name for that. <laughs> My wife's an elementary school teacher. Anyway, it's like, you know, a rectangle cube. <laughs> There's a proper word for that. But I just can't remember uh, what, what that's called. Someone's got, I feel stupid. But, you know, you know, the shape, the general shape of what if you were to capture, uh, you know, like, like almost like the, the, and the analogy would be put it in a bathtub so that the plants are above the water, but you've got like a what, just like your, your soil has a water table, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know how in the hell you would scale this in a garden. Maybe you have some garbage bags and you sort of have them cut out, but uh, you know, like I was thinking, if, let's say this was the only way I could grow something. I was stranded on an island with no soil, no soil but st bales of straw everywhere. Um, yeah, I wonder if that would work if you could just, because then all the nutrients wouldn't be lost. You just have this nasty soup underneath your bale and the roots would just barely be touching that nasty soup, but it would be drawn up into the straw through capillary action. Um, That's right. And well, then, then you basically have a hydroponic system. <laughs> and, and instead of using little stones or uh, some other fiber material, you're using straw, right? So... Uh, that's basically how you're gardening here. So at, at the end of the summer, what I really concluded was that there isn't much advantage to this technique. Um, the, you use a lot of fertilizer, a lot more than you ever do in a garden. You use a lot of water. You have to water all the time. Um, and it doesn't grow more or better fruit. Now, got to remember my test was done in zone five okay and a lot of these uh, happy users of this technique i think are in warmer zones so if i was down in zone eight and i had a long summer and i could take a couple months and condition these bales and get them ready and decomposing and so on and then i still have a lot of summer left to grow something they might work perfectly well yeah right? yeah but in a cold climate if, if you're going to use it in a cold climate, what I now would recommend is that you actually start the summer before, uh, like in August, yeah, and yeah, condition yeah. them so that they're ready to go in the spring. That's a good way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Right? Makes sense. But certainly starting them in the spring isn't going to work well in a colder climate because they don't condition in the in the cold weather and our seasons are too short. We, we can't lose a week on on uh, our season. Right. Right. We jump through hoops to gain a week. We, yes, yes, we don't, exactly. don't want to pick a technique where we lose a week. Right. I just got a message from a viewer the other day who was in Georgia and he was saying the spring peepers had started there already. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, you know? and, and I think, you know, if you're in a warm climate 
um, your analysis of this might be completely different. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So you might ask, well, who should use it? And yep. the only body that I think should use it is somebody who doesn't have any soil, right? So you don't have ground. You're, you got a driveway or your whole backyard's a big concrete slab or something, and you have no other choice. This is a technique you probably can get to work and get some crops. Right. I don't know how good it is for early spring, spring crops, um, but I'm, I'm sure you could learn how to adjust it a little bit. So for instance, if I was growing radishes and, and carrots, I, if I was doing it again, I think I would probably dig deeper holes, maybe six inch holes and fill them with soil. So right. now the seed actually has, has some place to grow into. Make it uh, into a flower pot. Yeah, more like a flower pot. And then as this, as the roots get larger, then it can grow into the straw bale. Right. But, but an inch of soil on tap, it, it doesn't do enough and it dries out too fast and, and it, it runs away and so on. So you probably can make it work. But I would say if you have soil that can be used, that's a much better option. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe you could um, put the bales out in March, but put clear plastic over them. Um, so that they're sort of, you know, when there is a sunny day, maybe you can get, oh, hopefully they don't catch on fire. Because uh, <laughs> hay has this, wet hay does have this, uh, actually, I'm going to take that back. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, haystacks can catch on fire, just, uh, you know, spontaneous combustion. So yeah, never mind. I never said that. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's not a good plan. But yeah, I was trying to think of like, who would be, in what situation might it be a, Another possible situation would be, let's say you just bought a property and you didn't have a lot of time to work with and you had a patch of ground that you wanted to convert into a garden, it was all grass. You could make that all straw bales and grow stuff in it year one. And that mm -hmm. would smother out all the, that would smother out all the uh, grass and kill everything underneath the bales. You'd have, it, it, <laughs> I don't know what adding all that, all of that fertilizer might do to the soil underneath. I, what would that, would that, um, um, you know, would well, that denude it, the soil? Would that be over neutral or too much? Most of that nitrogen is just going to run away, right? No, it's, it's true. It's just going to soak into the ground and then each time it rains or you water, it's just going to wash it out and it ends up in the rivers and lakes and it's just wasted. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, th that would be one use of it, I guess, uh, first year. Um, but again, you have to start early, right? And is, is that any easier than taking the time to actually make the garden? And... I, I don't think so. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it might be a, a quick, easy raised bed for someone that doesn't want to bend over as much. Maybe, you know, that's one way to but then you got to keep, I mean, if you got a bad back, you don't want to be lugging bales of hay in every year. They're not light either. So, uh, yeah, I don't, you know, maybe, maybe people can give me some comments and, and, uh, and suggest, you know, where I suppose for certain kinds of things, growing certain kinds of things, maybe, and I'm sure there's different ways to do it, but, uh, yeah. Now, having done the experiment, is there anything in your pros and cons article, which you wrote before doing the experiment? you've changed your mind on or did it pretty much confirm everything that confirm your hypo your hypotheses no i th i think the pros and cons are still all valid um i probably would add one more con to that and and that is that it just doesn't work in cold climates <laughs> right right yeah, yeah, or, yeah or that the the conditioning process has to be adjusted depending on your climate maybe that's a better way to state it right yeah so if I had taken uh, a month instead of 10 days, uh, I might've been able to get these things conditioned a bit more. Right. And then if I planted in that, it, I might've been a bit more successful. Um, but Would you... there, there, there just seems very few benefits for this thing, particularly with the high use of fertilizer. Yeah, right? yeah, no, that's, that just seems a bit, I mean, other than the cost of it, it just doesn't seem very, um... Well, it's just counterintuitive to the way I like to guard, but uh, yeah. um, why would you say the bales don't, I mean, I, I've got my own theory, but the bales don't get hot enough in the cold climate. Is it just because of the surface area? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's like a compost pile, right? If you make a compost pile that's what you know, two feet by a foot and a half, high and narrow, it, it never it never gets hot, right? Even if you build it perfectly with all the right amounts of greens and browns, and you you do everything perfect, a pile that small just never gets hot. Right. So right. you mean like um, four four feet high, but one foot wide by one foot wide, as opposed to four feet high and four feet wide by four feet wide. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the reason we use large compost piles is, is, I mean, in parts, if you have a lot of material, you need the space. But the main reason is, so you actually get enough heat in there to start the process. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, that's why tumblers don't work very well, because they, they're too small. And small piles don't work very well, too. You need a certain amount of mass to hold in that heat. Yeah, insulation sure. and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, like building compost piles here in March, they just sit there. They, they don't do anything. Even if you build a four foot by four foot uh, compost pile, nothing happens in March in our climate. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and now you've got this tiny little compost pile and you're saying, well, okay, heat up, decompose. Um, it's not going to happen. I know I, I often get the, because of the way I garden, I do this sort of no-till approach. And I, I often get the comment, it's a little bit off topic, but it's related to what you're saying. Um, do you watch Charles Dowding? You ever seen Charles Dowding's videos? This English yes. guy, really nice, nice guy. Um, and I said, why don't you do what he does? And it's like, I can't make compost. Like this guy can compost all year long, right? Yeah. Um, uh, also, I just think my method's easier, quite frankly, but I mean, his method is, the argument for the way he does it is to prevent slugs because you don't have all this, I mean, my, my garden is the greatest place in the world world for a slug or a snail because there's all these great places to hide. Um, but it's a lot easier because I don't have to compost stuff and bring it to the garden. It's all just composting in place. Um, but I also, there's, I don't know how many months of the year where it's almost impossible to compost on the kind of scale I'd need to compost to add two inches of compost to my entire garden every year, or at least an inch. To compost yeah. on that scale, holy smokes, I, yeah. I, can't, I can't compost all year, right? All right, so yeah, so that's really not much, not much has changed. For <laughs> Great, well, uh, you know, I enjoyed reading that. I definitely, you know, over the years, observing people talk about this, reading the same stuff you're reading, I, my spidey sense was always saying, how, also the issue of how would that scale to a garden the size of mine, 2,500 square feet. Now it's all that space isn't working space. Some of that's walking paths and so on and so forth. But let's say I've got about the equivalent of 50 four by eight beds. Mm -hmm. So that's like, uh, I don't know how many bales of hay I'd need to make a four <laughs> by eight bed, uh, at least four. Yeah, I had an interview with uh, Craig de Julier, the, the tomato guy. Okay. And he does everything on straw bales. Okay. And he does dozens and dozens of straw bales. And he's been doing it for years and it works great for his tomatoes. But again, he's somewhere down in Atlanta, Georgia, I think. Yeah. Right? But he takes his whole driveway and turns it into a straw bale garden. A driveway. Yeah. Which that makes so, sense. Uh, but you do have to get the straw bales and that's the other issue that uh, they're not the easiest things to come by. I mean, you would think they were easy to buy, but around here, most people are now making the big bales, you know, the big rounds. Yeah, those enormous things. Yeah, you can't lift those. Gardeners can't get. So you have to find someone who's still making the small bales. And uh, I was looking for a couple of years and couldn't really find anyone close by that, that had them. And now I have a, a local farmer who I, I get them from every fall. Yeah, but they're not the easiest things to come by. No, you yeah. could buy them here, but they're like anywhere from five to seven dollars a pop. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I usually scrounge a few. Um, you know, I, I drive through the city on my way into work every day. I work right right downtown, and uh, usually around Halloween, the wealthier parts of town, people buy three or four, and make a little display on their front lawn. Yeah. So yeah. I'll take a meandering route on the way to and from work through those parts of town. And just uh, you know, troll that because they throw them all away after things over. So <laughs> my wife will be complaining because there's all this hay in the back seat of my car and stuff like that. I'm like, 
you kidding me? These things are like seven bucks each, you know, <laughs> but that's the same thing here. I can't, I have to drive out outside of town. I got to drive like 40 minutes to get one of those or at the very least 30 minutes to get to a place where I can get a bale of hay. Um, but you, you do wait until after Halloween, don't you? <laughs> I just dress up uh, Halloween night and steal hay. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, uh, folks, uh, if you enjoy this podcast, uh, why don't you, uh, the, be the best way you can help support the podcast is to check out my sponsors, uh, Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Um, go to Vessi's website um, to buy their stuff, vessies.com. Use a coupon code GAVS21 and you get free shipping. The details are in the description box. Um, you can buy Safer stuff on Vessi's website and get free shipping. As long as you got one pack of seeds, in your order, you get free shipping for Vessi seeds. So if you got some, you want to buy some slug and snail killer or some of the different products I use for you know, your pest problems, buy them through Vessi's, you get the free shipping. And uh, you know that'll make uh, Safers happy as well. Also, we're going to have Robert back to talk about his book, uh, Soil Science. Uh, I plan to put that video up sometime around uh, spring when people are starting to turn the soil over and thinking about soil either March or April, that's sort of a release. So uh, you want to come back and talk about your book around that time of year, Robert? Yeah, glad to. Okay, awesome. Also, just a quick announcement for those that don't know, I, yeah, I started a new uh, a channel. This time of year in the winter, there's like, uh, you know, not a whole lot of gardening going on. I tend to do a lot of stuff out in the woods. So I started a second channel called Outdoors on the Cheap where I just go out and do stuff with knives and axes. In the summer, I'm going to be doing some spring and summer. I'll do some fishing and stuff like these are all things I do as well. Other than gardening, I'm basically out in the woods or down by the ocean, uh, fishing, hiking, exploring, stuff like that. Um, so you can watch me, you know, make a canoe paddle out of a tree. Just last week, I cut down a tree and turned it into a canoe paddle. Uh, not the best paddle ever made, but, uh, you know, if you want to see a guy take an axe and a knife and make a canoe paddle, <laughs> that sort of thing, right? So outdoors in the cheap, check that out. Um, and uh, I actually have a promo. The first thousand subscribers have a chance to win uh, a bushcraft knife. You can check out the details if you go to, uh, I've got a video explaining that, uh, that promotional, uh, uh, I guess you'd call that a prize. Uh, I'll put a link to it at the end of this video if you're watching on YouTube. But uh, anyway, Robert, it was great having you on the show once again. Um, and uh, everybody out there, until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching. Robert, thanks, you. thanks for coming on the show. Hey, it's great being here. <laughs> have fun this summer. Oh, yeah.